All right, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, tonight, we're going to look at a new sutta. Uh, tonight, we're going to be back in the Majima Nikaya. We're moving right on to the next sutta, number 47. It's on page 415. This is called the Vimamsaka Sutta, the Inquirer, or the um, Interrogator, or the Inquisitor. We'll, we'll get into what that word means and the idea. Um, well, actually, let me give you a kind of a quick just introduction to what the sutta is about, and then we're, we'll kind of start kind of working our way through it. So this is an interesting sutta to, tonight. We're kind of, um, I feel like we're very much kind of shifting gears from where we've been. Sort of a lot of the suttas we've been dealing with have kind of really been coming back to a lot of the same ideas. This one's kind of a little different. So what this sutta is about, well, it's <clears throat> it's tricky, but it's it's about the Buddha in that way. And specifically, it's actually about the Tathagata. And so tonight, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this term, this title, Tathagata, which is a title for the Buddha. Again, we're going to get into that. But what this sutta is basically kind of about, it's about, well... I actually want to put it out there from the beginning that we're going to look at it kind of two different ways. In one, in one instance, or in one way of looking at it, the sutta is about the, the Buddha, meaning like the person who started this religion, right? Called that we call Buddhism. So the founder, right? So, in many ways, this sutta is about that person, the Buddha. And it's a sutta about why you may believe the Buddha. And so by the time we're done, and it's a short sutta, so we should probably get through it all tonight. But at the end of the sutta, by the time we get to the end, we're going to be talking about the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, which of course are the three jewels or the triple gem. It's sort of like that's what makes up the Buddhist religion is the teacher, the teachings, and the students <laughs> in that way. And so this sutta is going to be focused on the first of those. It's going to be focused on the Buddha. But the question is, is like, why should you believe the Buddha? Now, the language that we're going to get into by the end of this evening is going to be the language of faith, having faith in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. We'll, we'll deal with that when we get there, but I just want you to know that that's what this sutta is about, is why should you believe the Buddha? Why should you have faith in the Buddha? That's going to be one way to read this. The other way to read it is going to be about... I would put it, I guess, as it, it's about authority within kind of the world of Buddhism. It's about who you should trust as a spokesperson. And what I'm getting at is, and I guess this will, this is going to start the very complicated conversation about Tathagata. <clears throat> So the sutta is entirely about the Tathagata or a Tathagata. And so what I'm getting at is, is that this word, which kind of basically you, you could gloss it as an enlightened person. <laughs> like, let's just kind of put it very simply. A Tathagata is an enlightened person in that sense. And so this term is actually a very old 
Indian term. It predates Buddhism. And that's a problem for us because the Buddha and Buddhism and all of the suttas, they never define it. They, per they presume you already know what it means. Or I guess what I should say, it's not that they presume you already know what it means, but this sutra presumes whoever's reading this clearly already knows what a tathagata is. So we need to kind of make it clear that this is a title for an enlightened person that predates Buddhism. It comes to be the title for the Buddha, but even within the world of Buddhism, this title is used for other people besides the Buddha. And that's where it gets tricky in terms of, well, who exactly is a Tathagata? Well, we could actually even use this sutta tonight to answer that question. So I just want to put that out there. It's going to, I think it'll be much clearer once we dive into the sutta. <clears throat> But because the sutta is never going to define this term tathagata, let's have a quick conversation about it. I think you'll find it interesting. So what it is, is that we have this word and I have put a little bit on my whiteboard. So that's our word, tathagata, tathagata. And this word tathagata is two words put together. But the problem is, is that nobody's exactly sure <clears throat> which two words. And what I mean is, is that this word tathagata <laughs> could be the word tathagata or tathagata. And the problem with Sanskrit is that they have this thing called sandhi. And sandhi is that when you take two words and smash them together, there's rules for how the middle syllable will work. And what I mean is, is that because of these rules regarding sandhi, it's not actually clear whether this is Tathagata or Tathagata. Because if you took either of those and smashed them together, the correct pronunciation would be Tathagata. <laughs> now, let's break that down a little further. You'll notice that both possibilities begin with this word Tata. And Tata, Tata basically means true. It's like, it's a very simple way to say true, but it has to do with like self-evidently true. And what I'm getting at is, is that there's another word in Buddhism, that, which is tathata, which is translated as thusness or suchness. And what I want us to start thinking about is I want us to start thinking about a sort of a, a way of talking about truth. But in terms of what is true versus false, it's about like, uh, you know, just a quick example. And I, I'm not trying to be tricky here. It's too early in the in the class. But it's about like, do I have a cup in my hand or do I have a balloon? And it's kind of evidently true <laughs> that it's a cup. Like, behold, it, it, it's so. And so it is tata. It's obviously true that it's a cup and not a balloon in that way. In other words, it's a particular type of truth that's not like logically arrived at through deduction, but it's just sort of like, be behold, that's tata, and then that can become this word tatata, or thus, <laughs> behold. So the word is, again, it's related to truth, but a kind of like self-evident, obvious 
look, it's true. Let's just for now, for simplicity's sake, let's keep it at it means the truth. Now what we have is, is we have two options, which is, is it gata or agata? And the word gata means gone. And you probably know it from the famous Heart Sutra mantra, the gate, gate, para gate, para sam gati, right? Bodhisvaha. Well, the gate part means gone, gone. Para gate, way, way gone. So gate means gone. And so tata gata, tata gata could mean truly gone, evidently gone. We'll talk about what that, we're going to go deeper in that in a moment, but I just want you to know that's one meaning, which is the tata gata, thus gone or truly gone. Interestingly, the word agata means to arrive, basically in a way to be born, to, to come into existence. And so it could be that it is thus arrive, having arrived from the truth or of the truth or out of the truth in that way. So it's this interesting possibility of thus gone or thus come. And there's a lot of scholarly debate about which it should be. Now, if you ask me, my feeling is, is that in the original languages, which would have been Pali and then Sanskrit, my feeling is, is that they were wanted a kind of double entendre, <clears throat> that it, 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 it's actually, it's beautiful because it's both. And it would actually be a shame to kind of come down on one side of it or the other in that way. So that's my feeling about it. And again, we're going to go deeper on what Tathagata might might mean. Uh, yeah, I think actually we could even do that. Yeah, let, well, let's go deeper into what this might mean then. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I want to make it clear that now I'm only talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, Mm. I want to make it clear that I'm only talking about the way this word is used within the Buddhist tradition. There's other religious traditions in India, such as the Jain tradition or the Jain tradition. They also use the word Tathagata for their spiritual leader or leaders. I'm not talking about their usage of it. But in the world of Buddhism, the way that I understand this word being used, we need to basically, and I can't, you know, I don't want to devolve into a, a whole Dharma talk about this. So I just need to rely upon your pre-existent knowledge of this. But what we want to be thinking about is all of the conversations we've had in Dharma doors about characteristics. So we've done a lot of talking about characteristics, right? I usually use like my big cup and my little cup to describe to you how the characteristic or the quality of being big isn't actually owned by the thing, but the mind becomes confused about characteristics and forgets this and attributes them to things. So for example, am I tall or am I short? And of course, you immediately, if you're a good Dharma student, you would recognize that, well, it depends. <laughs> and of course, any time in the world of Buddhism, any time where the answer is, it depends, we're talking about dependent origination. That's the that's the real quick go-to like mnemonic there. 
If it depends, then it's dependent origination. And so my being tall would de be dependent upon being either next to a short person or I don't need to be sitting or standing next to anybody. All I have to be is, quote, taller than the people you know <laughs> or like who you're used to seeing. And so if you're used to hanging out with NBA basketball players, if you're used to hanging out with seven feet tall people, if you see me, you're going to think I'm a, I'm a short guy, <laughs> right? But if you happen to be hanging around with shorter stature people, people in that way, and you see me, you might think I'm tall. But of course, I'm not tall or short. It depends on who I'm standing next to or what your definition of average height is in that way. Now, we've been through this before because we could then go a step further. Am I old or am I young? Once again, if I were standing next to an, an octogenarian or a nonagenarian, right, or a centigenarian, if I were standing next to somebody 100 years old, you would probably think I was the young guy. But if I was standing next to a teenager and I'm the guy with the white beard, I'm probably going to be perceived as the old guy. So I'm old in one situation, but I'm young in another situation. And again, the realization is it depends. And then again, we might not even, I might not even be standing next to anybody, but I could still ask you, am I older? Am I young? And you might have the idea that the average life expectancy of a human is, you know, whatever, 78, 90, 80, 80 years old or whatever. And if you have that idea that that's the average lifespan and you know I'm coming in at 50, then you might say, oh, you're old because you're half the you're past the midway point of your life expectancy, right? But I just want you to notice that me being old or young is totally relative and dependent. And so if we really got philosophical and looked at it really closely and said, oh, no, but am I old or am I young? The realization is, is that I am neither young nor old. That determ The determination that I am one of those or the other is just going to be a relative conditional determination. All right? So now we know that I'm not tall or short. I'm not old or young. And we can keep going with this, by the way. <laughs> we can keep going in terms of, am I male? Am I female? Am I this? Am I that? And all we would realize is that all of these designations are relative. <clears throat> now, if you're following me on this, and if you're kind of following me on this, like, it's kind of like a removal of the illusion or delusion that th those characteristics are here. All of these characteristics are sort of in the conditioned eye of the beholder, if you will, right? Now, if you're with me on that and you understand that any characteristic is just in the conditioned eye of the beholder, then we can start taking these off. I'm not old, I'm not young, I'm not tall, I'm not short, I'm not this, I'm not that. And if you keep taking them all away, you would eventually arrive at what is so, at what is such. And what I want you to do is, is you know, try to do it. Behold, 
behold, not male, not female, not young, not old, not tall, not short, not ugly, not handsome, not this, not that. If you get rid of all of those, what are you left with? Tatagata. <laughs> so the idea is, the first part of that word, tata, tata is referring to that state of being characteristicless, of being so, not old or young, tall or short, but just so. That's tata or tatata. And now the idea of a Buddha or a Tathagata is it is either one who is arriving out of that Tata, or it's the one who has gone, disappeared into that Tata, into that suchness. So either way, whether it's thus gone or thus come, there's a very interesting philosophical thing going on there with a tathagata. And, and what I mean is, and actually, let me add one extra little layer to this. The one extra deep layer about tata or tatata suchness Suchness is always right here. And what I mean by that is, is that there is no, like, <clears throat> yesterday, there's no suchness because it, it's like, it's an abstract idea about the past, already an abstract idea. And so my point is, is that Suchness is always absolutely, totally present. So it's absolute presence stripped of characteristics. So a Buddha or a Tathagata is that <laughs> in that way. All right. So that's, oh, I have, I, any questions though? Noe? Tathagata question. So what comes to mind is right view. Absolutely. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, it would be in a way, a Buddha, of course, is fully established in right view, but then also that to see the Tathagata as Tathagata is right view. Excellent, Noe. Okay, the one thing that I want to tell you about, though, and I'm going to, I'm putting on my little scholarly cap for a second, because I would love to share this with you. So, as you may know, there are these 10 titles of a enlightened person or a Buddha, right? There is Tathagata, Arahat, Sugata, which means well gone one. Uh, there is uh, Bhagavat, World Honored One, and I have the list around, but I just wanted to mention two. Two of those 10 titles, one of them is Tathagata, and another of those titles is Sugata, S-U-G-A-T-A. -A. And that word, Su, Su, is like with uh, like the word sukha. Su means like beautiful, good, smooth, well done. So there's su gata. And that's the gata, which means gone. And so one of the 10 titles of a Buddha is the well gone one. And that's that idea of a Buddha has gotten rid of all karmic traces. 
has no more rebirth possibilities. In other words, all of their defilements, all of their afflictions are gone. And so a Buddha is well gone, Sugata. I find it interesting that of the two titles, one of them is this idea of Sugata, Sugata, and the other is this idea of Tathagata. And the thing that I want to mention that not enough people mention when, because I've, I did a lot of research, you know, about Tathagata this week. And one of the things that nobody mentions is that from the very beginning, the entire East Asian, Chinese, Japanese, Korean Buddhist tradition, from the very beginning, they translated Tathagata as thus come and sugata as basically thus gone. And so the Chinese sort of seem to have picked up on the, the balance and the polarity of that idea of well gone and thusly come. And my point is, is that the, the, if, the, if the etymology of the word was not thus come, I don't think the Chinese would have translated it that way. They're, they're very astute uh, students of Buddhism. So I really think that the fact that the entire East Asian tradition has, has said, no, 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 the word means thus come. I, I find it interesting that everybody ignores that out of maybe it's like, oh, but that's the Chinese tradition. Isn't that after? And it's like, yeah, it is after. But the point is, though, is that they were, again, like really, really serious students of Buddhism. They wanted to be as accurate as possible. So I just wanted to mention as much as I could about Tathagata. Any last questions? Yeah, no. Something I think is true is that the the title Tathagata is often used by the Buddha to describe himself, maybe always, like when he refers to himself, he doesn't ever say the Buddha, does he? Maybe he does. Anyway, he's, he uses Tathagata a lot. And I wonder if that is has any repercussions in terms of if it means that's so, come, that's come. Thank you for catching that, Noam. I totally meant to mention that, that Another interesting thing about the title or the word Tathagata is that, yes, it's the word that the Buddha uses to refer to himself. The Buddha rarely uses the first person pronoun, the I. He does, but it's rare. And yeah, he doesn't refer to the Buddha, like himself as the Buddha, but he does refer to himself as the Tathagata. So he'll say like, uh, you know, according to what the Tathagata has taught, and he's referring to himself. But given everything that I just said about that word and its relationship to this idea of suchness, it kind of makes sense. Because for the Buddha to say like, last week, I told you guys this, this, and that that would sort of be dharmically or philosophically inaccurate. The, it's, the Buddha is only so, only present. And so that's the, the Buddha's interesting way of always being present in that way. So thanks, Noam, for reminding me of, of that, reminding us of that. All right, let's get to the sutta. And let's see, so now we, now we know, you know what they're going to be talking about. So, um, Majima Nikaya, Sutta number 47, the Vimans Vimamsaka Sutta, the Inquirer. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Savati, in Jetta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. 
And the Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, a bhikkhu who is a inquirer, a vimamsaka, not knowing how to gauge another's mind, should make an investigation of the Tathagata in order to find out whether or not he is fully enlightened. Venerable Sir, the bhikkhus say, our teachings are rooted in, in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One have the Blessed One as their resort. It would be good if the Blessed One would explain the meaning of these words. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the bhikkhus will remember it. Then listen, bhikkhus, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the bhikkhus replied, and the Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, a bhikkhu who is an inquirer, not knowing how to gauge another's mind, should investigate the Tathagata with respect to two kinds of states, to two kinds of states, states cognizable by the eye and through the ear. Right. So, once again, one should investigate the Tathagata with respect to two kinds of states, states cognizable through the eye and through the ear, thus. So you should think, are there found in the Tathagata or not any defiled states cognizable through the eye or through the ear? And when the bhikkhu investigates, they come to know. No defiled states cognizable through the eye or through the ear are found in the Tathagata. All right. So a couple of things. The reason why I actually really wanted to do this sutta is I actually think it's very important. And what I mean is, is that it's, it's about following people or like for me tonight is about this idea of following people, following or following religions, following teachings, following leaders, just following people. And it's sort of about like, why should you follow this person versus that person? And the idea would be like, imagine, you know, that there's a, um, you know, a, a religion, you know, call it a cult or whatever, but, you know, imagine that there's a group and, you know, a friend of yours got, gets involved in the group and it's like, all right, what's going on with your cult? Like, you know, why are you into this guy or this, this, this woman or whoever, right? Some person, why are you into them? And what we want to think about is, you know, that there could be answers of like, well, because they can fly or, you know, they can perform miracles. They're, they're basically superhuman beings. And it's like, oh, wow, superhuman being. Wow. So this sutta is sort of about, again, why should you follow the Buddha? Now, one of the things that's actually really, uh, like very significant about this sutta is the Buddha is encouraging the students to challenge him and to challenge his sort of position in that way. And this is actually kind of, I mean, especially kind of in India at the time, this is, seen, I mean, at least from what I've noticed, this is a rarity to have like the, the guru really encourage being open to criticism in a way, it's really refreshing. So I just kind of want to emphasize that, that that's what's going on. And the idea here is, the, the language here, you might not have caught it. The Buddha says that if there's, if, if one of you, if somebody out there, right, wants to inquire, but they don't know how to, quote, gauge another's mind, Right. That idea, by the way, you just kind of need to know that within the world of Buddhism, there is this understanding that one can develop the ability to read another's mind. Like this is part of the tradition. And what that would mean is, is that if you had achieved such a state where you could read another's mind, 
well, then you would just be able to know that this person is enlightened. You would actually just be able to know. So the Buddha is saying, I know that most of you don't are not able to read other people's minds. So if you don't have that special ability, then inquire of the Tathagata based upon what they do and based upon what they say. In other words, the language of the sutta is about the things that are cognizable by the eye. So that's like how they look, how they're acting. And things cognizable by the ear is what are they saying in that way? And so the idea here is, is that somebody who is a vimamsaka, an inquirer, should investigate the tathagata with respect to those two kinds of things, what can be seen and what can be heard. And then they should ask themselves in terms of looking at the tathagata, are there found here in this person or in the tathagata any defiled states that I can see or that I can hear? And then the idea is, is that when the bhikkhu investigates the tathagata, they do not see any defiled states. Let's talk about this idea of defiled states for a moment. So, of course, what we're talking about is sam kleshita. I believe it's something to that effect, but with kleshas. Defiled is this idea of with the kleshas. But what are the kleshas? We know the kleshas, of course. They are the three poisons. We are talking about them every Sunday night in terms of this attraction, aversion, and confusion, or greed, anger, delusion, different ways to translate those three. And I actually, I wanted to, yeah, we have plenty of time. I want to mention these real quickly. Like, I want to dig in and clarify these. In other words, what would it look like or sound like if the Tathagata did have defiled states? Well, let's think about it this way. The first of the kleshas, the first of those afflictions is this idea of attraction, right? This is raga, right? But of course, attraction, raga, is usually within a Buddhist context translated as lust. So what we're talking about is somebody whose demeanor, their, the way they are physically, well, you could imagine it is somebody looking at you like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're looking really good tonight. What are you doing tonight? You want to get together? So there could be this kind of exuding of desire. There could be the speaking of desire, right? And it would be very obvious if somebody were speaking in a kind of, well, certainly if they were speaking in a lecherous kind of that kind of a way, but I just mean in terms of somebody, even if it's not about sexuality, if it's somebody that's like, oh, I, I can't wait. I can't wait for this, this, and that. So the desire is like evident and obvious in what they're doing and in what they're saying. So in a Tathagata, you would see no signs of that kind of desire, that needy, craving, addictive wanting. You wouldn't see it and you wouldn't hear it from a Tathagata. That's how you would know. That's how you would know that you were in front of a Tathagata. Or they might be angry. Why'd you do that? You stupid. Looking angry, <laughs> sounding angry. That would be displaying <laughs> signs of the second klesha. So if somebody cannot control their anger and they are always getting angry, short-tempered, odds are they're not a tathagata. <laughs> so greed or desire or lust, anger, 
Let's talk about moha, though, the third affliction, the third klesha. We don't actually kind of dive into that one enough. So in terms of, I really wanted to spell this one out too uh, tonight. And what it is, is we, I'm, I'm, there's so many ways that we could talk about this, but I'm just thinking about it tonight in terms of like, how I could come across to you. And, and what I also mean is, is like, I could encounter you and my uh, demeanor again is about being desireful. Or you could encounter me and my demeanor is about being angry. Another way that we could encounter each other, it would be sort of along the lines of me hoping you're impressed by me, hoping you think I'm smart, or the opposite of it, if I, let's say I, um, uh, whatever, let's say I sneezed and, and um, uh, snot came down my face. I might be embarrassed by that. What we want to look at from a Buddhist point of view is what underlies embarrassment. And of course, what we want to be thinking about is that ego, that sense of self that we have and that we protect and that we guard. And so what I'm getting at is, is that Delusion is about taking care of your ego in that way. And basically this, you know, emotions like pride and conceit and embarrassment and all of that, that's all ego. And I want you to notice that it's not actually about desire. It's not about anger. This, these emotions like embarrassment and things are actually about a self. But just from a, and you know, I know you're all Dharma doors attendees, so I know you know all of this. So look at it really, you know, carefully. And what I want you to think about is think about the e egoic concern about do I look good? And notice that it's about this body, you know, the body that keeps changing every moment and has been changing every moment since you were born and you haven't had the same body twice ever. <laughs> so notice that you wondering if you're looking good <laughs> is rather delusional in terms of you and your relationship to the body, because which body? <laughs> so my point is, is that when we start to look at embarrassment, and again, all of those things, we start to notice that those are about the third klesha, the delusion or confusion about what's going on here. Not the greed, not the anger, but all of these other things that are wrapped up in self. If you encounter a tathagata, though, in their appearance and in what they're saying, you won't see any signs of desire or greed. You won't see any signs of anger. And you won't see any delusional concern about the self. This sutra is actually going to go deeper into that. So I wanted to like put that out front. But Okay, so that's the first criteria. Defiled states. Any questions about that? Oh, by the way, I did want to remind us. This sutta, it could be exclusively about the Buddha, the historical founder of the religion. Or it could be about anybody sort of um, speaking on behalf of the Dharma. And I say that because the sutta is going to actually shift into talking about just teachers in general, not the great guru, teacher, the Buddha. So... All right, so the next one, 
when one comes to know this, so when one comes to know that the Tathagata has no defiled states, when one comes to know this, one investigates further, asking, are there found in the Tathagata or not any mixed states cognizable through the eye or through the ear? Now, mixed states is defined as basically, uh, well, let me put it to you this way. The first one, defiled states, it's somebody who is always greedy, always angry, always delusional. We're talking about just completely, you know, defiled in that way. The question about when you, uh, you, when you investigate the Tathagata, are they of mixed states? The definition of that is basically somebody who is a practitioner, is on the path, and so is for the most part avoiding the afflictions and all of that. But every now and then, they might get angry, they might have desire, and they might be delusional. So that's like the mixed state where they're good most of the time, but not all of the time. Regarding the Tathagata, though, when one investigates the Tathagata, one comes to know no mixed states are cognizable through the eye or through the ear. None of them are found in the Tathagata. And when the bhikkhu, when the investigator comes to know this, they investigate further. And they ask, are there found in the Tathagata or not cleansed states cognizable through the eye or through the ear? And when one investigates the Tathagata, one comes to know. Cleansed states are cognizable through the eye and the ear. They are found in the Tathagata. All right. So that's the first sort of grouping of these. Defiled states, mixed states, cleansed states. A tathagata is cleansed in that way. No more anger, no more greed, no more delusion. And when one comes to know this, one investigates further and asks, has this venerable one atta attained this wholesome state over a long time? Or did he attain it recently? When one investigates, one comes to know this venerable one has attained this wholesome state over a long time. He did not attain it just recently. All right, so you don't just get to have like a good day and get to be called a Tathagata, right? So the idea is that this is over a long period of time that one has sustained and stabilized such a purified state. And so the again, the idea is, is that if you meet somebody, they're claiming to be a Dharma teacher and they're not angry, they're not desirous, they're not delusional in that way, but you know that last week they were. Probably not a Tathagata just yet is the idea. All right. Now, when one comes to know this, that the Tathagata has not just recently attained this, one investigates further and they ask, has this venerable one acquired renown and attained fame so that the dangers connected with renown and fame are found in him? For bhikkhus, as long as a bhikkhu has not acquired renown and attained fame, the dangers connected with renown and fame are not found in him. Ah, but when he has acquired renown and attained fame, those dangers are found in him. But when one investigates the Tathagata, they come to know. This venerable one has acquired renown and attained fame, but the dangers connected with renown and fame are not found in him. So this is an interesting one, of course, 
I find it fascinating that Buddhism actually spends a fair amount of time talking about the pitfalls of fame. <laughs> and it's really interesting, especially kind of if you're if you're in the world of like spirituality or if you're in the world, especially of Buddhism, there are, of course, those Dharma teachers that become very famous and notable. And some of those teachers sometimes have, <laughs> there's dangers involved in that. Um, and of course, what they are talking about, well, they're talking about a number of things. They are talking about sort of inflated ego. That's definitely going to be a, a, one of them. And uh, self-aggrandizement will be another one. But it's also sort of, it has a lot to do with donorship too. And, and what I mean is, is that, you know, the Buddha and Buddhism, is, at least in the early days, it was really, really big about how you know, even the Buddha was out there in the streets begging for food. And that was like maintaining this utter humility. And there's really great, there's one really great sutra. I forget the name of it. Ah, oh, which is it? It's it's one of the ones where a, a king, it might've been a Jatashatru or somebody, but they go to see the Buddha. And when they get to the Sangha, the king's like, which one is he? It's like one of the best moments in that way where it's like, yeah, w which one's the Buddha? W whereas in a lot of other religious traditions, the guru would be clearly identifiable, right? So Buddhism is very concerned about what can happen when you get a little bit of renown and a little bit of fame. There's, there's other discourses about it, but when it comes to a Tathagata, these dangers of renown and fame, they are not found. So. Any questions about any of that? Pretty straightforward. Cool. All right. So, when one comes to know this, that the Tathagata is not problemed by renown and fame, one investigates further, asking, is this venerable one restrained without fear? Not restrained by fear? And does he avoid indulging in sensual pleasures because he is without lust through the destruction of lust? When one investigates the Tathagata, they come to know. This venerable one is restrained without fear, not restrained by fear. And he avoids indulging in sensual pleasures because he is without lust through the destruction of lust. All right, so... I kind of would like to keep coming back to this idea that we could either be talking about the Buddha and why you may want to believe in the Buddha. Like, like um, you know, if I could be sarcastic, what's so great about the Buddha, right? Like that kind of idea. Well, what's so great about him? Well... He's transcended greed, anger, and delusion, for one, right? He's been that way for a very long time. He's not corrupted by fame and renown, has no fear, and no sensual pleasures because, they, because he has cut off lust. So one way of talking about the Buddha is, is this way. And that, that's why the religion of Buddhism, in a way, should be believed or followed in that sense. So that's one way to read this, that we're talking about the founder. But again, another way to read this, though, is it's about anybody in a position of spiritual authority. And my point is, is that the, the Buddha or the, yeah, the Buddha here is giving us the criteria 
that we may want to use to, to judge our spiritual leaders. And again, what I think is really, you know, refreshing about this is it's saying you have the faculties to determine this and you should actually be able to interrogate the teacher. You should be able to interrogate the spiritual leader and, and deduce these things. They shouldn't be like in, you know, in closed back rooms doing things and you don't know what they're doing and all of that. It's like, no, this is about what is observable in that sense. So, Buddhas or Tathagatas in that sense do not display signs of fear. They are not controlled by fear. That's the other side of that. They're not restrained by fear, right? I'll, many of us in that way are restrained by fear in that way of like fear of going to jail or fear of this or fear of that. So it's like I avoid doing certain things, but to avoid the consequences out of fear in that way. Buddhas are not following these rules out of fear in that sense. They're not restrained by fear. And then, of course, that idea around sensual pleasures and the destruction of lust. They doing okay with all of those? Cool. So this is where <clears throat> the sutta kind of moves to a new pattern. Because now what it is, is that it's about the individual. And maybe this is somebody who is thinking about becoming a Buddhist and they want to know what's so great about the Buddha. Or it's maybe you have a guru. Maybe you have a spiritual teacher yourself from a, you know, like a Tibetan Buddhist tradition or a Zen Buddhist tradition or, you know, some tradition. The idea is, or the way that I read this sutta is that you should hold your Dharma teacher accountable to these things in that way. And not that they have to display these, but if they're claiming to be a Tathagata, they should display these in that way. So, so this is about the individual either becoming part of Buddhism or just their teacher and then what they should observe and listen for. Now, bhikkhus, if other people should ask the bhikkhu, what are the venerable one's reasons? And what is, their, what is the evidence whereby you say the venerable tathagata, the venerable one is restrained and without fear, not restrained by fear, and the Tathagata avoids indulging in sensual pleasures because he is without lust through the destruction of lust. So if somebody comes to you and says, well, why do you say that about the Buddha? Right? Answering rightly, that bhikkhu would answer the person this way. Whether that venerable one dwells in the Sangha or alone, while some, while some there are well behaved, and some are ill behaved, and some there teach a group, while some here are seen concerned about their material things, and some are unsullied by material things, still the Tathagata, that venerable one, does not despise anyone because of that. And I've heard and learned this from the Blessed One's own lips. I've heard him say, I'm restrained without fear, not restrained by fear, and I avoid indulging in sensual pleasures because I am without lust through the destruction of lust. So this is a really nice one, real, another really important one, if you ask me. So... If somebody comes up to you and says, well, how do you know that this is true of the Tathagata? How do you know these things are true, right? And the answer is, well, because I've seen him. <laughs> I've seen it with my own two eyes. I've seen that 
when whether the venerable one dwells with the sangha or alone some people are you know if, if there's people that are bad behaved or good behaved some people that are you know just wrapped up in their material things some people that are not wrapped up in their material things the buddha the tathagata doesn't despise anyone that's how you know it's a tathagata in that way and of course the other part of this is and because i've heard it from his own lips he's told me <laughs> he's told me that he's beyond fear in that way and that he doesn't indulge in sensual pleasures because he's destroyed lust so that's the next that's so the first is about you questioning the tathagata right or observing the tathagata with your eyes and with your ears the next is if somebody comes and asks you and now in section 11 the tathagata bhikkhus should be questioned further about that this way so you should directly ask the tathagata are there found in the tathagata or not any defiled states cognizable through the eye or through the ear the Tathagata would answer thus, no defiled states cognizable through the eye or through the ear are found in the Tathagata. If asked, are there found in the Tathagata or not any mixed states cognizable through the eyes and the ears, the Tathagata would answer thus, no mixed states are cognizable through the eye or through the ear are found in the Tathagata. If asked, are there found in the Tathagata or not cleansed states cognizable through the eye or through the ear? The Tathagata would answer this way. Cleansed states cognizable through the eye or through the ear are found in the Tathagata. They are my pathway. They are my domain yet I do not identify with them. <laughs> so, you know, that's a very powerful line, it's a very powerful statement there. So cleansed states. So the state of being without lustful desire, the state of being without anger, the state of being without egoic confusion, that's cleansed. And the Buddha says, regarding those cleansed states, they're my pathway and my domain. <laughs> Yet I don't identify with them. Powerful. Any questions about that idea? Pretty straightforward there. In practice, of course, this is all sort of a different thing in that way, meaning to truly not identify with the state of being not desirous or not angry in that way. So basically a Buddha is not angry, is not desirous, is not deluded, but wouldn't identify as being so. Noe. <laughs> I like uh, in the note, is is it's quite clear. Uh, the note is uh, four eighty eight. Uh, 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 I am without craving for it. Yes, that's yes. that's lovely. I am yes. with craving for that state. Excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. Ah, and now, <clears throat> so. Uh, I guess, section or paragraph 14. So paragraph 14 is where I wonder, ex you know, I wonder exactly how we should be reading this sutta. Because paragraph 14 says, bhikkhus, a disciple should approach the teacher who speaks thus in order to hear the Dharma. And it's kind of like, are they exclusively talking about the Buddha? or just any teacher of the Dharma. 
Again, it could kind of go either way. But again, the teacher teaches this person, the bhikkhu, the dharma, with its higher and higher levels, with its more and more sublime levels, with its dark and bright counterparts. As the teacher teaches the dharma to a bhikkhu in this way, through direct knowledge of a certain teaching, here in that dharma, the bhikkhu comes to a conclusion about the dharma or about the teachings. He places confidence in the teacher thus. The blessed one is fully enlightened. The dharma is well proclaimed by the blessed one. The sangha is practicing the good way. So that's where we have the sutta kind of coming to the all three of these, you know, the triple, triple gem, the three jewels. So now we kind of see the way this sutta is tying those all together in that way. Where, so the Buddha, the Tathagata, the teacher, is now that, meaning that which is without greed, without anger, without delusion, for a long time, without fear, all of that. So that's the teacher. And then the teachings, the Dharma, that is well stated, right, is about that, <laughs> Meaning it's about being without anger, being without delusion, and being without greed. It's not about developing superpowers. It's not about going to heaven and being reborn with God. It's about these things. And the Sangha are the people that are interested in that. <laughs> They're practicing the good way. Now, a key term is brought up here. So in paragraph 14... It says that the bhikkhu who has received their teaching from the Buddha, it says that they place their confidence in the teacher, right? So the word confidence is this word shraddha, and that's the Sanskrit pronunciation. I'm not sure the Pali pronunciation, but that word shraddha is normally translated as faith. But I really, really appreciate that they're translating it as confidence because it's indeed how I understand this word or this idea of shraddha. I actually even prefer the translation of certainty, being certain. And I've I've given this Dharma talk a little bit in the past, but I it's very appropriate to the sutta tonight. So these terms or this idea of having faith or confidence or certainty in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, I want to kind of really make it clear that the word Shraddha and, and like what they're talking about when they're trying, like when Buddhists are trying to encourage you perhaps to have faith in the Buddha, they are not, Buddhism is not talking about blind faith. And just kind of for the record, in case anybody out there doesn't know it, blind faith is the idea that, you know, you could, it could be this kind of thing of like, you know, I believe that if I'm a good person, I'm going to go to heaven. And somebody could ask you like, well, how do you know that? And the answer would be, I just know it. Like, I can't explain it. I just know it. That is what I would call blind faith. Buddhism in no way, shape, or form even wants that at all. When Buddhism is talking about shraddha or faith, if particularly when they're talking about like shraddha in the Buddha, what they are talking about, or my understanding of what they're talking about, is it something like, and I always use this example, but I think it's one of, it's the clearest example I can think of. You take, for example, the noble truths, the four noble truths. In particular, let's just focus on 
the relationship between desire or craving and suffering versus the third noble truth, which says, if there's no craving, there's no suffering. The idea is, is that you can reach a certain point in understanding the four noble truths where you see it. You see it clearly in yourself and in others, where you just see the relationship between craving and suffering. It's as clear as day. It's right there. It's so obvious. At that point, you could say that you have certainty in the noble truths. You've got confidence in them. You have faith. But notice it's not blind faith. It's, it's not that it's like, oh, if, if, I, if I believe in Buddha, my suffering will go away. No, this is actually psychology, deep psychology about what is causing suffering and telling you the mechanisms that are creating it. And you can reach a certain point where you're like, that is what's causing my suffering. And if you're established that way, where you, where you know it, that's called shraddha. And the idea is, is that you could reach a certain point. Actually, let me put it to you this way. My feeling about it is that for me, it's not about having faith or even confidence or certainty in the historical personage of the Buddha. For me, the faith, confidence, or certainty in the Buddha or the Tathagata, for me, the, it's actually about that's desirable or meaning, yeah, that's it. Not having anger, not being greedy, not being delusional. Yeah, that's it. To, to be that way is right. <laughs> not Again, not to fly around and not to display supernatural powers, but to not be angry, not be delusional, not be greedy. Yeah, that's a Buddha. And so I just said a, like, that's a statement of faith or a statement of certainty about what is Buddha, that that. My confidence in the Dharma is that it leads to that. And my confidence in the Sangha here, my faith in the Sangha, is that we are all collectively interested in that. That's what we are practicing the good way in that sense. So that's my little spiel on faith in the three jewels. Yeah, Noe. Shanda. Shanda. Not tangha, tangda, but shanda, a good craving. Ah, a nice. Good desire. Nice. As opposed to a, a desire that you don't want. Is it Chandra? Chandra. Chanda. Chanda, yes. I, the, a good desire. We're all, thank you. Yes. I think they would say bodhichanda, like the desire for a, awakening in that way. Yes. Okay. So now let's, um, unless there's any other comments, questions. Cool. So let's finish up the little sutta here. So paragraph 15. Now, if others should ask that bhikkhu thus, what are the Venerable One's reasons? And what is their evidence whereby you say the Blessed One is fully enlightened. The Dharma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, and the Sangha is practicing the good way. So if somebody asked you that, answering rightly, that bhikkhu would respond saying, Here, friends, I approached the Blessed One in order to hear the Dharma. The Blessed One taught me the Dharma with its higher and higher levels, with its more and more and sublime levels, with its dark and bright counterparts. As the Blessed One taught the Dharma to me in this way, through direct knowledge of a certain teaching here in that Dharma, 
I came to a conclusion about the teachings. I placed confidence in the teacher thus. The Blessed One is fully enlightened. The Dharma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One. And the Sangha is practicing the good way. Bhikkhus, when anyone's faith has been planted, rooted, and established in the Tathagata through these reasons, through these terms, and these phrases, their faith is said to be supported by reasons, rooted in vision, firm. It is invincible by any recluse or Brahmin or God or Mara or Brahma or by anyone in the world. That is how, bhikkhus, there is an investigation of the Tathagata in accordance with the Dharma. And that is how the Tathagata is well investigated in accordance with the Dharma. That's what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So that last part there is a it's a term, or I should should say it's a phrase that you do find a lot in the world of Buddhism, and it's the phrase invincible faith. So not just faith, but indestructible, invincible faith. And you know, regarding kind of my my comment or my example of blind faith. The idea of like, well, if I'm a good person, I'm going to go to heaven, right? There could be a way, and I'm not saying necessarily, but there could be a way that you have that kind of blind faith, but then things just keep happening and you're wondering, is this really going to, is this really what's how this works? Is this really what's going to happen? Like, because this person keeps like committing all of these bad actions and they're just getting richer and richer and all of this stuff. It's like, I don't. And so my point is, is that a blind faith that's not established on something firm could be a little shaky in that way. Meaning things in life could sort of challenge it and it might, that faith might waver. Whereas what we just talked about was coming to a very clear understanding of the Dharma for oneself. And not only that, but the tradition itself has provided you with a means of investigating it and basically saying, yeah, and if this doesn't hold up to scrutiny, you shouldn't believe this in that way. So my point is, is that a type of shraddha or a type of faith that is established on reason, right? Where it says it's supported by reasons rooted in vision and firm. The idea is, is that a faith that is established that way, it's unshakable. It's invincible. It's so solid and clear that there's a way in which well, first of all, there's a way in which nothing could come along and shake that or rattle that in that way. So it's sort of, um, but it's also, if I can you know, speak from my own faith in that way, it's about understanding how all-encompassing the Dharma is. And I don't know quite how to explain this. It's sort of a, a thought I'm having at the moment right now. But it's about how, you know, that, you know, Dharma, the Dharma is so interesting. Buddha Dharma is so interesting because there's a way in which it is, how can I put this? It's kind of contentless. And, and what I mean is, is that, you know, it's about like suffering, but what that leaves very open is the reality that we all suffer differently. 
that we were all suffering from different things. And so the Dharma is not about specific things that cause suffering. I mean, the Buddha talks about them as kind of anecdotal examples, but the Dharma is about this universal suffering problem. And there's so many other ways in which Buddha Dharma is contentless. And it's about, well, truly, it's about dharmas, principles, not, you know, exactly ph specific phenomena in that way. And so what that does is, is that if you really kind of start to understand the dharma, you realize how it's, it's talking about everything. And I... And they do, by the way, of course, they talk a lot about in the world of Buddhism, especially in the world of Mahayana Buddhism, they talk a lot about developing what's known as sarvanya, omniscience, all knowledge. And actually, let me, I'll use this as an example, because somebody out there will find this interesting. So when I when I say this thing about uh, that Buddha Dharma is contentless, here's a good example of what I mean by that. Let's say that you are going to learn a language, a, a, a foreign language, right? There's one way of learning a language. And what it is, is, is that you basically, you take all the vocabulary, and all the grammar rules, and all the conjunctions, and all the everything, and you just start stuffing the rules and the vocabulary into your mind. That would be content. And that would be taking the content of a language, like the dictionary, and filling your mind with it. That's one way to learn a language. And again, that is with content. There's another way to approach learning a language. And what it is, is it's about understanding language itself, like communication, the very nature of it. And what that is, is that if you start understanding language, like the rules of language, you, you could basically be given one word of a language and re kind of reverse engineer the entire language because you understand the rules of language. You don't need to learn every single word. You understand the structure of it. Now, I know, I know that that's a little like of a wild idea of like, learning a whole language without actually learning the language. But polyglots, people who learn a lot of languages, they start to understand the nature of language. Like they start to understand that, oh yeah, every language has this and that and this and da 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 da, -da. And so pretty soon you begin to understand again, just the structure of language. Well, allow me to kind of extrapolate Buddha Dharma, I think is a lot like that, but it's of course not a language. It's kind of a philosophy of what's going on here, but it's not about the specifics. It's about the overall structure that can be understood in again, in that way. So to go back really quickly to my example of suffering for example, the Western, in general, Western psychology and Western psychotherapy, like if it's trying to work with like a, let's say a trauma, it's going to go digging for the specific content of that trauma and try to get at, you know, what event brought that about and, you know, digging into the specifics of that trauma event versus just understanding the nature of 
suffering and why that happens. And then being able to figure out what's causing the trauma, but not through the content of it, but through these principles in that way. And so again, just to state it one more time, if you get to the point where you understand these principles, you start to see it everywhere. And at that point, it becomes what I said earlier, all encompassing. And you start to realize like, oh, if there's Martians on the planet Mars, I understand why they would be suffering. I don't have to meet them. I don't have to know anything about them, but I would know the nature of why they would be suffering. Maybe they want more moon rocks or maybe they want more Mars rocks. It doesn't matter. They probably want something. They're probably craving something on Mars. Maybe they want to get off Mars or whatever it is. But I hope you kind of see my point where the Dharma are these principles, so, which by the way, yeah, I just got done with a session. Uh, uh, Jill recommended the body keeps the score. And I had a session recently with a student going through that book because they were, so, so I just recently read it and indeed it kind of keeps, it's that same, and it's in the Western psychological tradition, but it's the same idea that we were just talking about regarding trauma. <laughs> Okay, that's enough from me. Any last comments or questions or ideas? Noe? Uh, yeah, hey, thank you, Michael. Wow, it's uh, definitely worth reading again and again. Nice. I just have one little question and maybe this is a personal question. Uh, it's that last paragraph is that when anyone's faith has been planted, rooted, and established. So is, can I replace the word faith with confidence when anyone's confidence has been planted, rooted, and established? So if we talked about that, oh, thumbs up. Thank yeah, you. I would strongly encourage that. Yeah, I'm not, only because of the, con the Christian connotation, I don't like the word faith. It's, it's like, sense. it's a great word, but it just has baggage. <laughs> it's theist. Thank you. Yeah. No. Yeah. One of the things I was thinking about uh, in the kind of main section about confidence in the Buddha and then connecting it to the Dharma and the Sangha and, uh, and, and proving it for yourself. It seems to me there's like a, so like a little loop where, you know, the Buddha says, Oh yeah, you know, try this, less craving will re reduce your suffering and and you're like oh okay let me try that and then you try it and lo and behold it works you know then that kind of gives you more confidence in whatever else the buddha says <laughs> you know and it's kind of true i think with the sangha as well i mean for me anyway people who i can talk to about the dharma and can be like well what's your experience of such and such and they have an experience that you know, resonates with mine, then I'm like, oh, well, this is probably a good person to you know, talk, talk to about Dharma, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's kind of a feedback there. Like you have to experience for yourself, but you you can be willing to try something out if you hear it from someone who has shown that they're trustworthy. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and what you're saying, Noam, is really actually kind of why I wanted to share this sutta and do this one is to really, you know, celebrate the the Buddhist tradition for being so, you know, open to this interrogation and in a way not, not wanting you to be a part of it if it's not through like actual understanding of it, you know, and I, and I do think that there's just so much, you know, everybody out there, you know, you know, I came into this as a kind of scholar of religion and then became a Buddhist teacher. But so from the world of religion, you know, it's it can be scary out there in terms of the religions that are like, no, 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 don't think about this. Like, don't worry about what's behind the magic screen, right? Like we, we've got it taken care of back there. So I really just love Buddhism for this constant uh, refreshing, you know, encouragement to interrogate the Buddha, interrogate the Dharma, all of that, so. Jill, Jill. 
Yeah, sorry. Um, can Is you it hear Gil me? or Jill? Sorry. It's Gil. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm coming actually from Canada, um, British Columbia. Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually thought I was signing into a different meeting. So serendipity, <laughs> I guess there. <laughs> uh, but I signed in late because of that. I thought I was signing into another one. Uh, and I really uh, appreciated your talk. I wasn't sure if I was going to stay because I signed into the wrong meeting, but I was entranced. Um, so, um, really appreciated it. And I was wondering if I could actually get the details of the sutra, uh, like what sutra were you actually covering? Cause I signed in late and yep. also what are the details of the meeting so I could sign in again? So awesome. sorry about that. Yeah. No, no, sorry is necessary. Uh, Noam, I think is going to put in the chat, the links for the sutta that we were doing tonight. There it is there. And there's a link to a translation and all of that. And this is Dharma Doors. Uh, this is a, a sutra studies course or a sutra study group. We meet every Sunday night from 7 to 8.30. Uh, I'm Michael, or MC Owens. I'm here every Sunday night. Uh, we pretty much do a, a different sutta every night. Some of the longer suttas will go, you know, it'll be part one, part two. Um, but yeah, and it's open to all. Um, and because we do a new sutta pretty much every Sunday, you don't have to have come last week. You don't have to come next week, but we're glad you're here this week. So. Okay, cool. And that I think I thought I was signing into North Star or something. Is that uh, does that sound <laughs> right? No, or okay, if you could like drop the Zoom link also, because <laughs> I'm like totally confused as to what. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how life works i guess yeah so i don't know if you could drop the zoom link because i don't I, I apparently got the code right <laughs> but, yeah. <that> was, <laughs> you were meant but to be i here. would love to say yeah it was awesome thank you nice. oh, my <laughs> all right <laughs> cool. yeah i think gnome's gonna drop that there you go that's the zoom link so there you go all right everybody That'll do it for this Dharma Doors then. Um, again, we'll, we'll do a new sutta next week. So I hope to see you all then. Have a great evening and a great week.